Happy Sabbath to each and every one of you who are watching online. We want to welcome back our Orange and Anaheim Church family, and also to those who are just watching online who might be friends or extended members as well from other churches. Welcome here to the Orange Seventh-day Adventist Church, and we are delighted that you are with us. Uh, we are completing our week of prayer today, this Sabbath. We've had a wonderful week with amazing speakers on the theme of the person of the Holy Spirit. And we hope that you are blessed today by this service to culminate our week of prayer. We want to inform you of some information that we have received not only from uh, Orange County, but also from our church headquarters. Uh, we know that we are in a different tier. We are currently in the third tier of the color red and moving ever so closely to the next tier, orange, and hopefully be able to open soon. We don't want to give a date, we don't know all the possibilities, but we do know that we are moving ever so closer and we will keep you updated when we get more information on what that looks like. We want to remind you also of our food pantries at the Anaheim Church is every single Wednesday beginning at 5 o'clock until food runs out and also our pantry here at the Orange Church. We hope that you are blessed by the service and may God continually bless you. Thank you. I'd like to wish my brothers and sisters a happy Sabbath, wherever you are. We know you're not here, but we know you're somewhere. So we wish you a happy Sabbath. And be, as we begin our Sabbath program, I'd like to start with inviting our two pastors, Pastor Mark and Pastor Nathaniel, up on the platform with me, please. As many of you know, October is Pastor Appreciation Month, and we would be remiss if we didn't acknowledge our two wonderful pastors, Pastor Mark and Pastor Nathaniel, who have the pleasure of navigating two churches, the Orange Church and the Anaheim Church, during an unprecedented, in our life, pandemic. So it is with great honor that we acknowledge Pastor Mark oh, thank and you. Pastor Nathaniel for being our wonderful great pastors, especially during this pandemic time. We thank you so much for your courage, your perseverance. We thank you for your navigating so well between the two churches and, and, and reaching out to a congregation that you can't even see visibly, but you know that they're there. So we thank you, and can, can I have a word of prayer for both of you? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that in your wisdom, you have given us two pastors. We, we thank you, Lord, that they are committed to you, that they are faithful to you, and that they are navigating two churches during an incredible pandemic time. We thank you, Lord, that you love us so much that you provide for our needs according to your riches and glory. And now we ask a special blessing upon Pastor Mark and his family as he continues in service to you, Lord, and upon Pastor Nathaniel and his family as he also continues service in both the churches. We love you and pray all this in your holy and precious name. Amen. Good morning once again, dear church family. It is time for us to sing together, and our opening hymn is number 569, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior. Pass me not, O gentle Savior, hear my humble cry. Hear my humble cry, 
while on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Trusting only in thy merit, would I seek thy face? He Wounded, broken spirit, save me by thy grace. Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. spring of all my comfort, more than life for me. Whom have I on earth beside thee? Whom in heaven but thee? Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. Hello boys and girls, happy Sabbath. I'm very happy to be with you. If mom and dad are watching the church service and maybe the kids are in another part of the house, call the kids over because this is one of my favorite times of the service, a time dedicated just for kids. Boys and girls, I have a couple of special things to show you today. And before I show them to you, I want to let you know that when you see these things, your mouth might have a reaction. Your saliva might start going because you might see something delicious. And what we call salivating is how your mouth says, I'm ready to eat that. Isn't it funny that even seeing a picture over the screen, we might start to salivate and have that saliva in our mouths? I'm going to show you two things today. Hmm, I wonder which one I should show you first. Here we go, I'll show you this one. Uh, and I'll show you this one. Uh, two things. Now let me ask you, which one are you more salivating for? Which one do you want to eat? As we think about that, I have a few questions for you. Which of these two is the healthier thing? Do you know which one is healthier? I hope the answer is obvious for you. Yeah, of course. Here's my next question. Which of these is more natural to eat? Which one's more natural? Yes, again, this one. And here's a third question. One of these things, if you eat them, is more likely to make you thirsty, whereas the other one is actually likely to satisfy your thirst. Which one is more likely to make you thirsty? Of course, this one. After you eat this, you might need to have a drink of water or milk. Whereas this one, it has the drink inside with the snack. Isn't that wonderful? Here's one more question before we go to our next part. If I were to eat these and then throw the extra part away, which one would stay in the dump forever and ever versus which one would go, it's what's called, I think, biodegrade back into the ground to become something else? That's right, if we threw this in the dump, it would just stay there forever and ever, whereas if we threw this away, it would gradually become a part of the dirt and it could become something else in the future. So for several reasons, even though this might be the more immediately appetizing, for several reasons, this is the better thing to eat. Here's one more thought that I had. Have you ever opened up a bag of Cheetos? Mmm, and you're eating the Cheetos, mmm, yummy, so good, and you find something inside? Oh, what's this? It's a coupon. What does this coupon say? Coupon for infinity free bags of Cheetos? You know what infinity mean, kids? Infinity means limitless, right? Have you ever found a coupon like that? No, you've never found a coupon like that. Cheetos never puts in coupons for infinity free bags. Cheetos says, if you like the Cheetos, sure, we'll give you more Cheetos, just give us another dollar. Okay, very good, you like those? Give me another dollar, here's some more. Oh, you like that? Give me another dollar, here's some more of that. But there's something very different when you eat into a piece of fruit like a pear. 
When you eat into a piece of fruit like a pear or an apple or a banana or anything, you find these very small things called seeds. And these seeds are basically a coupon for infinity more pears in this case. God says to us, did you like eating that? Okay, I will let you have as many more if you like, and you don't have to give me any dollars. This can actually turn into a pear tree. Isn't that something? It's so much smaller than the pear itself, and it can turn into a tree. Now it takes some time, and it takes some dirt, and it takes some sunlight, and it takes some water. But think about it, who really provides the time? Do we provide the time? No, God provides the time. Uh, who provides the dirt? Dirt is pretty much everywhere. The only place there isn't dirt is when we cover it up with cement or with a building. But God put dirt everywhere. What about sunlight? Where is sunlight? Sunlight is everywhere. And where is water? Water is free and it's everywhere. We live in a dry climate, so we got to bring it in with pipes most of the time. But basically what God does with seeds is he tells us, if you take a little bit of time and a little bit of care and attention, and you put it in the dirt and you give it some water and you give it some sunlight, you can have infinity pieces of fruit. A tree might grow 300 pears in a year, and then the next year you'd have 300 more. And guess what? If you planted the seeds from those pears, you could have, if the first year you could have 300 trees, the next year you could have, what is it, 9,000 trees? How in the world? Man, the math just gets so big so fast. This shows that God's way is different than the world's way. The world says, give us money, we'll give you a little something you like. Give us more money, we'll give you a little more. God says, I will give you more and more and more for free. Which is better, friends, God's way or the world's way? That's why the Bible says that God's economy, God's way of thinking is totally different than the world's. The world loves to take, whereas God loves to give. I pray that we would return our hearts to the giver of every good gift. Amen? Amen. God bless you, friends. The Lord graciously invites us to come into His presence in prayer. The Bible tells us that we can come boldly before the throne, and we want to take that opportunity. As we prepare to do so, let's invite Him into our hearts. We'll sing the introductory song as we come to you in prayer. Now, dear Lord, as we pray, take our hearts and minds far. And now we invite our congregation to join us in our garden of prayer. Let's bow our heads. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you now as your children. Here once again, Lord, celebrating your Sabbath. We thank you, Lord, that you have made it possible. Even though we can't be together visibly, we can be together online and during our um, video time. Lord, I want to thank you for all those involved in making this worship service possible. Lord, we, we thank you for Dave Calder and all the hard work he has been doing to make this a positive experience for all of our members, our church family. Lord, we thank you for our pastors who faithfully come each week and, and more than once to also make this 
worship service possible, and all those, Lord, who participate, our music, our readings, and thank you, members of our church, for tuning in and wanting to be part of this family by, by worshiping with us online. Lord, you know the issues at hand with the politicians, with the voting. You know, Lord, the, the illnesses that are going around. You know, Lord, for the people that have suffered with this virus and those that have lost loved ones. We ask a special prayer for them, Lord, that your hand of mercy be upon those that did lose loved ones to this virus. We also, Lord, pray for our first responders and firefighters that have been battling continuous fires up and down our coast. Lord, strengthen them. Give them the stamina they need to continue. Bless them, Lord, for their commitment to you and their courage. We also pray for those, Lord, that might have been um, experiencing job loss or furloughs. We pray, Lord, that your hand of mercy will be on them as well and that they will be able to make a living and be able to survive this pandemic time. Now, Lord, we, we thank you that we can have our worship time together in spite of the issues at hand, and we pray that you will be with Pastor Nathaniel as he breaks the bread of life with us. We thank you and we praise you and we pray it all in your precious and holy name. Amen. Happy Sabbath to the Anaheim Church and to the Orange Church. For scripture reading, I ask you that you will open your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 5, verse 16 through 19. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Jesus Christ for you. Do not quench the Spirit. Amen. How have you enjoyed our week of prayer this whole week? It's our first week of prayer for the fall of 2020 and it has been a powerhouse this whole week. I'd like to thank all of our speakers from Annie Mejia, Annabelle Quick, Trisha Burgos, Vicki Murphy, and Ariana Baran. All of these are the leaders of this church and all of them have been following Jesus for many, many years and we have learned so much about the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit in this whole theme. I'd also like to thank our musicians who've been helping out, Pastor Mark, Mark Borowski, and our ukulele ministry team. It has been just an incredible experience. It's been educational, but also inspirational, especially our time of prayer. And today we're going to close out our week of prayer with the final theme, with our final aspect of the person of the Holy Spirit in how He indwells believers. How does the Holy Spirit indwell all of us as believers? 
Well, before we continue further, I'd like to open up with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Dear God, we are so grateful for the gift and the promise and the person of the Holy Spirit. God, many times in the world we live in and other religions promote different things and this uh, syncretic ministry or world that we live in constantly views you as something else, some faraway being who doesn't connect or maybe is, is in a rock or in a tree. But the person of the Holy Spirit is a person and we get to commune with that person as believers as church members as the body of Christ so God we've been so grateful for the word that we have heard of the Holy Spirit but God we ask even now that you would speak to us now on how you move even today amongst your people especially in the text we're going to reveal today we ask for your blessing we ask that you would speak to us now and that we would hear. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite you to turn your Bibles with me to Isaiah chapter 38. Isaiah chapter 38. We are talking today about the power of prayer in the person of the Holy Spirit. But to better understand who the Holy Spirit is and how he indwells believers, we need to see what the interaction is between God and his people. By understanding and seeing how God interacts with his people, we get a better understand how he interacts and ultimately how he dwells and indwells in his people. Especially during times of distress and fear. You hear in the world around us that it's very important to have friends and friends stick by us in hard times. You read in the scriptures as well how they say a friend even sticks closer than a brother, but we hear the words of Jesus claim or Paul share that the Holy Spirit actually understands us by simply the groans of our hearts. The Holy Spirit is so intimately connected to his people that he knows what we're saying, what we're thinking, what we're experiencing without even hearing our words. Just by simply the groans on our hearts, he understands. I don't know about, about you, but I know there's a lot of groaning and fear going around in the society that we live in today. I know when we're hearing about the presidential debates and we're looking at COVID uncertainties, we're looking at the stimulus checks and people with their mental health and the list continues. And the strange thing about this whole thing, it all erupted so suddenly. Do you remember that? And like a domino effect, it just happened to where we shut things down. You look at Isaiah chapter 38 and you begin to see a similar picture amongst the people of God who've experienced the same thing throughout their history, throughout their time. We see in Isaiah 36 and 37, just the chapter before, Israel is being attacked by the Assyrians, by this amazingly powerful king Sennacherib, who's probably one of the top arch enemies of Israel. And just by the prayer of God's people, an angel comes and strikes down thousands of them and they praise God and they pray to him. But immediately after this deliverance, immediately after God's mag magnifying his power, all of a sudden, another disaster strikes. It's true, not just amongst Christians, but amongst people as human beings, you're either in a storm or coming back into another storm. And the advantage that we have as Christians, as believers, is we're not in it alone because the Holy Spirit hears the groans of our hearts. Isaiah chapter 38 verse 1 and it says this, In those days Hezekiah became sick and was at the point of death. The prophet Isaiah son of Amoz came to him and said, Thus says the Lord, set your house in order for you shall die. You shall not recover. Suddenly, out of the blue, out of nowhere, all of a sudden, the leader of Israel, their righteous king, who's by far the most righteous kings of almost any king that's ever been in Israel besides David, he himself has come down with a fatal sickness. And he's at the point of death. We don't know what he has, but we could surmise from verse 21. It says it was a huge lump that was healed. Could this be that he had cancer? 
Could it, could it be that he had something that was outside of his control that even the physicians and the doctors of the time can do nothing? Death was at his door of this righteous king. And the question we need to ask ourselves, church, is how deep are the sicknesses that we have? I'm not just talking about the physical sickness, but the sickness that we have as people. You see, prayer is an element. It's not just a spiritual element that affects us spiritually, but prayer changes even the physical body as believers and as people and ultimately changes us as our ultimate identity in Jesus Christ. That's what prayer does. Prayer is not just the spiritual element in the spiritual realm. No, it's a very physical thing that changes us, that redirects us, that gives us hope, that gives us direction, that changes the very identity and the image of who we are to be more and more like Christ. Now, I don't want to confuse this illustration by talking about political parties or about people. No, what Hezekiah is going through is something that you and I, as believers, go through. As people today, from one situation to the next, from one storm to the next, constantly bombarded by life and the craziness that that entails. And it's no wonder that people are falling apart and thinking prayer does nothing because they're thinking it's simply limited to the spiritual realm when prayer changes everything, church. It changes everything. The very presence of the Holy Spirit indwells in us. And so I'd like to share with you four ways that prayer allows God to indwell us. The first one I'd like to share with you is the Holy Spirit informs us. Before the Holy Spirit does much, He informs us. Who is this Holy Spirit? What is He about? I'd like to share with you the text that Elder Trisha read for, or Elder, our Elder Burgess read for us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16 to 19, and it says this, Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Do not stop praying. Give thanks in all circumstances, not just the good, not just the bad, in all circumstances. Give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you and for me. And I love the way it finishes the next verse. It says, if you don't do this, do not quench the Spirit. You will quench the Spirit in your life if you don't do these things. Because prayer is not just about the spiritual realm. It affects us in a deeply physical way. In who we are, in what we do, in what we become. Do not quench the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in your very being. And prayer is a catalyst for that church. We can't just pray when we're in situations of being overwhelmed. We have to rejoice always, not just in the good, but in the bad. Because when we do, as we're constantly rejoicing, as we're constantly praying, we have the opportunity to see the situation from a totally different perspective. A second way is that helps us is that it helps God to speak to us directly about something we may be doing wrong about the sin that's around us, about the sin we may be going into, or the sin that God is saying, this is going to kill you. Be aware of what you're doing. God never shies away from sharing with us how to bless us, how to keep on the straight and narrow, and how to honor His name. God never shies away from that. And we could know that more clearly if we're informed to know to stay connected, to rejoice always, to pray without ceasing, to give thanks in all circumstances, because this is God's will. Do not quench the Spirit. This is what God informs us to do. The second thing, other than just informing us as believers, as Christians, what we need to do to stay connected is after that, God instructs us. Look, look at the text of what happened. Look at what the verse says. He said, the prophet Isaiah came to him and said, Look, King, get your house in order. This is it. They're going to die. 
What's the human tendency when you hear these words? If you're in front of, this, in front of a physician and they tell you these words, that lump on your body is cancerous, you have three months to live. What is the typical human tendency to do? I remember a couple years back when my mother got that news. She got news that she had cancer in her uterus. My whole family was broken. We were scared. We didn't know what to do. My mom tried to hide the news from me and both of my brothers and we didn't know what to do when she finally shared. She said, I don't know what to do. We said, Mom, go get surgery. Do whatever you have to do. And I remember that day before surgery, my mom came to me and she says, Nathaniel, I want you to be the one to make the decision if something goes wrong. I had no idea how to handle that situation. My mother, not going to my father, not going to my older brother, she came to me and she said, Nathaniel, it's going to be on you. I went to my wife and I broke. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to handle the situation. I said, Lord, why my mother? My mom has been faithful to you since before I was born. She's done so much in the church. What has my mother done? Why? Why, Lord? The prophet Isaiah told Hezekiah, get your house in order. If you ask my wife today about how I handle sickness, I act like a baby. If I get a headache, if I get anything, I'm on the ground and she looks at me like, get up, stop making this big of a deal. A lot of us in many ways have handled the situation of sickness, of solitude, in so many different ways. We've been hit, we've been hurt, we don't know how to handle it. The world we live in today usually responds in two ways when these things arise. They say, you only live once, go ahead and just live your life. I've seen movies over and over again on comedies of saying, hey, you have a couple days to live. What do they do? They sell their house, they cash out their retirement, they travel the world, they do all these crazy, amazing things, and then they either don't die or the, it was a joke, and they say, hey, guess what? You didn't have cancer. They did all these random things because they knew they only had such a short time, so they just went out and did what they could. Some other people might go the other route, just, we have to find a cure, we have to find, we have to do whatever we can to get better. But Hezekiah did something first. He was tuned to God. He knew where salvation comes from. He knew where the source of his strength and his hope and what he's been doing his whole life, where it came from. He turned to God. I love in our week of prayer on Monday, we talked about the Holy Spirit as life. And Annie shared, look, when you have the Spirit, you have life. If you don't have the Spirit, you don't have life. This is not just a spiritual thing, church. This is a physical thing. Having God in your life changes everything. Our purpose in this world is solely to glorify God. How deep is your sickness? How deep are your ailments? How deep is your brokenness? And the reality, church, is when we look at prayer, it's not just a spiritual exercise or in the spiritual realm. It is a deeply physical thing that changes and molds our identity and makes us into a better image and representation of who Jesus is. The third item is the Holy Spirit ingrains in us our relationship to Him, reminding us of Him, that regardless of what happens, we then become ingrained in who He is and what we are about, that it becomes second nature to turn to Him in all circumstances. Notice in verse 2 what Hezekiah does. As soon as he gets the news from the prophet, it says this, Then Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord. Remember now, O Lord, I implore you, how I walked before you in faithfulness with a whole heart and have done what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. He just wept. He wept, not because of his own heart, but because he knew that God still had a purpose and he wanted to be a part of that. He was the king and a representative of the entire country. He was the most righteous of all kings and he knew that he still had so much more to do to serve who God was. Remember your faithfulness, Lord. And he wept bitterly. I want us to notice that this is not a self-righteous prayer. 
This is a prayer of a plea of a man who wanted to serve and still minister on the behalf of the people and to show the world who God is. Notice where he turns. He turns his face to the wall. Turn with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 7. This is when the temple was being built. God had been traveling in a sanctuary, in a tent for years and years. And finally this, this whole temple was built. And after it is built, I want to read this beautiful verse that God shares to Solomon and to the people of God. He shares this in chapter 7 verse 14 of 2 Chronicles. He says this, If my people who are called by my name humble themselves, pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. This is the posture of Hezekiah when bad news came, not just for the kingdom, but for his very life. His posture turned to the Lord and he said, Lord, remember your faithfulness. We need to have a posture ingrained in us, church, that as we walk with God, as he informs us, as he instructs us, that we become ingrained in the spirit and the indwelling, that we know where to turn. We must turn each and every moment in these times of good or bad or brokenness or blessings, our posture always to God. There are physical postures that we have. We obviously know that we kneel down in submission to God to remove the distractions, as Psalm 46 says, to be still and know that I am God. We know also that in Psalm chapter 121, verse 8, it says that God will protect you in your coming and your going as you communicate with Him. This could be as you're driving, as you're going on walks, as you're going. You don't always have to close your eyes. Remember, Paul says, pray without ceasing. You don't always have to use formal language. As the Holy Spirit even says, He understands the groans of our heart, but this communication with God is constant. I love the prayers of Daniel. It says that he faced towards Jerusalem. He faced towards where he knew the presence of God was. You might need a special room. You might need a special chair. You might need a special time of day. But I can't emphasize to you the beautiful time of prayer at midday. Many times we pray in the morning and in the evening, but I can emphasize the realigning of your mind, of what's going on in your life, whatever it might be, that prayer at midday changes everything. To pray without ceasing, and this becomes ingrained in this church as the Lord leads and speaks to us. Lastly, the last posture, which is one we don't see often, is the one that David did when he completely blew it. When he sinned and he murdered and he committed adultery, he lied face down on the ground in posture, in repentance. And church, I submit to you today, there are times when we need to be face down on the ground, arms spread out, praying to the Lord. Because we recognize how deep the sickness is, how deep the brokenness is, how holy and righteous our God is and wants to bring healing into our lives. Hezekiah turned and called out to God. Today, church, we must recognize there are times that we need to weep and not just confess for ourselves but pray for the land and the world and the church and our families and weep for them and pray for them for the Holy Spirit. How deep is the sickness, church? How deep is our brokenness? Prayer is not just a spiritual experience. It's a deeply physical thing that transforms and changes our physical lives and brings us that much closer to our identity in who Jesus Christ is. There is so much that's not right in this world right now, church. There is so much that's not right in society. There is so much brokenness right now. And trying to do it in our own ways and control just pushes us further away. But there is a fourth, and that is that the Holy Spirit also inspires us. The Holy Spirit inspires us. Scripture reminds us that 
God does not treat us as our sins deserve. God is a gracious God. God is a loving God. He is long-suffering and always willing to forgive. We read in this fourth verse of Isaiah 38, verse 4, and it says this, Then the word of the Lord came to Isaiah, after he saw him weeping, after he saw him repenting, after he saw him, Lord, I'm here for you. The Lord told Isaiah to go tell Hezekiah, Thus says the Lord, the God of your ancestors, David, I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. I will add 15 years to your life. I will deliver you and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria and defend this city. Prayer changes things. God hears our prayers. God still speaks, church. He still speaks. And once again, we begin, we rebegin this process. At the end of this, when God inspires and brings healing, he then informs. Look at verse 7 as it says this. This is the sign to you from the Lord, that the Lord will do this thing as he has promised. See, I will make the shadow cast by the declining sun on the dial of Ahaz, turn back ten steps. So the sun turned back on the dial, the ten steps, which it had declined. The Holy Spirit informs us, he instructs us, he ingrains in us, he inspires us. This is how God indwells his believers, is he's in constant communion with us as we continually pray and rejoice and give thanks and do not quench the Spirit, church. How deep is the sickness, church? It runs deep. It goes down to the core of our humanity and human nature and our sinfulness and our brokenness. But there is the Holy Spirit, church. That even if we don't know what to say, He understands. What is our posture to Him? What is our inkling and desire and thirst for the Holy Spirit? To ask for His guidance, to ask for His indwelling, to seek His face, to ask God to heal our lands, our very bodies. I'd like to close with a text in Ephesians chapter 1. You see, there is another sign that is given to God's people. There's another sign of the Holy Spirit that many times we overlook. There's a gift of this Holy Spirit that reminds us that we are His chosen people. And He begins here in, first, in Ephesians chapter 1. And it says this beautiful text here. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, to be holy, to be blameless, found in his love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will. And verse 7 goes on and says, In him we have redemption through the blood of the forgiveness of the trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. And I'd like to go all the way down. To verse 13 and it says this in him you also when you have heard of the word of truth the gospel of your salvation and had believed in him you were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit we were given the seal of the Holy Spirit this is a sign that God has given to us this is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption of God's own people to the praise of his glory. Church, we have the seal of the Holy Spirit in our very beings if we receive the forgiveness of our sins through Jesus Christ. He speaks to us, he informs us, he walks with us, he ingrains in us, and he inspires us time and time again. How deep is the sickness, church? How deep is our brokenness? And may I submit to you, as the same is with Hezekiah, the same can be with us. To give glory to God in all circumstances. To give thanks in all circumstances. Because this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the Spirit.
Amen. Thank you, Pastor Nathaniel, for inspiring us with that moving message. Truly, it has been a blessing being out on the lawn each evening, being one in the Spirit, fellowshipping, being in prayer. And as we conclude this week of prayer, let's sing hymn number 478, Sweet Hour of Prayer. See?